Hello, dear students. If you can see. Uh, let's start our lesson. Uh, and today's topic uh, is the mechanism of passive transport. And today's goal of our lesson explain the mechanism of passive transport and our success criteria. Uh, describe the type of passive transport and explain the mechanism of passive transport. And now let's continue our lesson with some essential questions. Uh, let's move uh, and go to whiteboard. Cells, whether in an animal's body or living independently, are surrounded by a watery environment. What keeps a cell's contents, which is mostly water, from escaping into its surroundings is a clear envelope called the plasma membrane. The membrane itself is too thin to be seen with a light microscope. What we are actually seeing is the boundary between the cell's cytoplasm and the surrounding fluid. That a membrane is present becomes evident as this amoeba is squeezed under a cover glass, rupturing its plasma membrane and spilling its contents into the surrounding water. The membrane not only contains and protects, it's also a gateway for molecular traffic. One kind of molecular traffic that has a very immediate effect is the movement of water molecules through the membrane. Water molecules are in constant motion, causing particles suspended in water to dance. The particles are responding to the bombardment of speeding water molecules. To learn the mechanism of passive transport, we need first to understand clearly what is the specific of the transport in the living organisms, and second, to know the details of the cell membrane structure. Let's talk about the transport in the living organisms. We have several transport systems in our bodies, such as circular and respiratory. But in each case, we talk about moving from one cell to another one. And as you know, cells have boundaries, such as cell membrane and probably cell wall. And uh, substances go across these barriers. So, in terms of living bodies transport, we should imagine the cell membrane structure before. Uh, the cell membrane structure. The cell surface is extremely thin, about 7 nanometers. However, at very high magnifications, it can be seen to have three layers, described as trilaminar appearance. The membrane is partially permeable and controls exchange between the cell and their environment. Like all other cellular membranes, uh, plasma membrane consists of uh, lipids and proteins. The fundamental structure of the membrane is the phospholipid bilayer. The plasma membrane is made up of several organic molecules. I will concentrate on two of them in this presentation. The first molecule is a lipid. It is called a phospholipid because instead of the usual three fatty acid chains, there are only two. The third bonding position is with a phosphate group. The phospholipid molecule is divided into a head region and a tail region. The head region is the glycerol and phosphate group. The tail region is the fatty acid chains. The head is hydrophilic, attracted to water. The tail is hydrophobic, repelled by water. It is this property which allows for the unique molecular alignment that makes the plasma membrane. If a droplet of phospholipid was put into water, a mycel would form. A mycel is a sphere with the hydrophilic heads on the surface, the tails inside away from the water. Our bodies are made up of approximately 60% water and trillions of cells. The water can be found inside the cells, outside the cells, and in the bloodstream. The location of water and the phospholipid, hydrophilic, and hydrophobic ends enable the membrane to form a bilayer of lipids. The currently accepted model of the cell membrane was developed by Singer and Nicholson in 1972 at the University of California, San Diego. Pictured here, the plasma membrane looks like a sea of lipid with icebergs floating in. The membrane is very flexible and has a fluid motion. 
This design of the plasma membrane is called the fluid mosaic model. Quite often, these proteins have sugar molecules attached to them, forming glycoproteins. These molecules extend from the membrane surface and act as an identification marker. The proteins are used by the immune system to identify a cell as being self, or foreign, called non-self. Each individual has their own biochemical makeup. In other words, each human being has their own set of cellular proteins. But if a cell comes into the body that has a different set of proteins, whether it is a bacteria or an organ transplant, the immune system may identify it as self or as non-self and attack. In order for the cell to survive, many different materials must be able to cross the plasma membrane. When water passes through a cell's membrane, the type of diffusion is called osmosis. When solute particles pass through a cell's membrane, the type of diffusion is called dialysis. Before looking at this movement through the membrane, it is important to understand the movement of molecules in general. Atoms and molecules are in constant motion. This random motion will disrupt the cluster rather than maintain it. This motion is referred to as Brownian movement. This motion is always present in some degree, in gases, in liquids, and even in solids. This can enter or leave a cell. It's a passive and active. A passive is a simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. It's for water only. And active is for molecules and for particles. And one very important thing about the passive transport. Passive transport mechanism uses no external energy source to bring about diffusion of a substances across a membrane. So it does not energy. Uh, and now several important definitions. Uh, of our process. Uh, first one is diffusion. Diffusion is the process by which molecules spread from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration of substances. Uh, when the molecules are even throughout a space, it is called equilibrium. Next definition is a concentration gradient. It's a difference between concentration in a space. Next one is osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across the membrane from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration of this substance. And next one is a facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is a movement of specific molecules down a concentration gradient, passing through a membrane via a specific carrier proteins. And now let us talk about the types of passive transport uh, that present our students. Uh, and now we are going to work in groups. Each group we we'll discuss only one type of uh, the passive transfer. And after each group, we will present uh, their job. Please come to this table uh, and choose the label uh, of types of passive transfer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Single diffusion. What was his love? Asphosis. Asphosis? Uh, diffusion. Osmosis is a net of movement of water molecules from a region of higher water potential, diluted solution, to a region of lower water potential, concentrated solution through a, par through a partial permeable membrane. Osmosis is a special example of diffusion. Diffusion and osmosis are both passive. Energy from ATP is not used. A partially permeable membrane is a barrier uh, permits the passage of some substances, but um, uh, others it allows the passage of the solvent molecules, but not some of the largest uh, solution molecules. If we take two cells such as these two, uh, water will move in this direction from area with higher concentration 
to area with a lower concentration of water. Uh, water entering the cell will make it swell up and unless the extra water is uh, expelled in some way, uh, the cell will burst. Conversely, if the cells are surrounded by a solution which is more concentrated than the cytoplasm, water will pass out of the cell by osmosis and the cell will shrink. Excessive uptake or loss of water by osmosis may damage cells. For this reason, it is very important that the cells in animal bodies are surrounded by a liquid which has the same concentration as the liquid inside the cells. Uh, in vertebrates, the concentration of blood is monitored by brain and adjusted by the kidneys. By keeping the blood concentration within narrow limits, the concentration of the tissue fluid remains more or less constant and the cells aren't bloated by taking in too much water or dehydrated by losing too much. Some major examples of osmosis are uh, absorption of water by plant roots, reabsorption of water by the proximal and distal convulsive tubules of the nephron, reabsorption of tissue uh, fluid into the vein, uh, venal ends of the blood capillaries, Absorption of water by the elementary canal, stomach, small instant and, and the colon. Plant cells in hypotonic uh, solution cell have lower water potential. The plant cells gain water by osmosis. The vacuole and cytoplasm increase in water. Uh, the cell membrane is pushed harder against the cell wall causing it to stretch a little. The plant tissue becomes stiffer. Target. Plant cells in hypertonic solution. Um, cells have higher water potential. The plant cells lose water by osmosis. As we call, and cytoplasm decrease in volume. The cell shrinks away from the cell wall. Shrinkage stops when the cell set is, uh, is at the same concentration as the external solution. The plant tissue becomes facet, it uh, has ch chunk. Uh, slightly may go on to become the smallest. Uh, turgor. Turgor is the pressure of the swollen cell uh, contents against the cell wall when uh, the external solution more dilute than the cell step uh, of the vacuole. Role of turgor in plants. Mechanical support for soft non-woody tissue. Change in shape of guard cells forming the stomatal open, opening between them. Uh, enlargement of young immature plant cells to mature size. Let's say that I have this green container, and inside this green container I have some air molecules. Now the air molecules, we assume that there's some temperature, there's some average kinetic energy to them, but they're all going to have different velocities, they're all going to be bumping around in different ways. Now the way that I've drawn it, you might notice something. On the left-hand side, and I'll just draw an imaginary line here. This line has no, no real, I guess you could say, structural significance. It's not like it's actually dividing it. I'm just using it to visualize the left and right-hand sides. You see on the left-hand side, I have a higher concentration of my molecules. Higher concentration. And how do you measure concentration? Well, the number of molecules per, it, well, the really way that you should do it is unit volume. But we're looking at a cross-section here. If I were to take a section that large, Look, I got four molecules here. It looks like I have about four, three to five molecules per section around that size. Well, if I took a that size section on this side, I'm getting one or maybe two molecules. And I'm not going to get too precise, but it's clear that I have a higher concentration here. I have more molecules than we have drawn it per unit area, but if we're thinking in three dimensions per unit volume, than we have on the right-hand side. So we have a higher concentration on the left. We have a lower concentration on the right. Lower concentration concentration on the right. And when you have this situation where you have a higher concentration and then a lower concentration, we call this a concentration gradient. The concentration is changing from high to low, and so we call this a concentration 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 gradient. Now what do we think is going to happen? Let's say this is this is what our situation is right when we look at it. What do we think is going to happen? Well, these, all of these particles are all going to be bouncing around. Things can move from the left to the right. Things can move from the right to the left. 
but we have more particles on the left that are likely to move to the right than we have particles on the right that are likely to move to the left. Remember, they're all moving in different directions with these random velocities, but I have more on this side and they're all bouncing around. So in any given moment, when we have this higher concentration on the left, I have a higher chance that I'm going to have stuff go from the left to the right, go from the left to the right, than I do from the right to the left. And so as time goes on, as time goes on, it's going to look something like this. If we let this system stabilize, if we let the system stabilize for a while, it should look like this. And let me see if I can do a good job, a good job drawing it. And I'll just draw the molecules. I won't draw their actual, their actual velocity vectors. So if we wait a while, how many molecules did I have? One, two, three, four, five, six. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So now I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So if we let enough time go by, we see that we don't we should no longer have a concentration gradient, that the, the concentration should be fairly uniform over time. So even if I were to draw that imaginary dashed line, if I were to draw that imaginary dashed line, I should have the same concentration on both sides. So I no longer have a gradient. I have no gradient. And once again, there's nothing magical here. It's not like the, the molecule said, oh, we are less concentrated over there. I somehow have to know to move there. You just have to think that these are all just randomly bouncing around. And if you have a higher concentration on the left, there's a higher chance that you have bounces or you have things moving from the left to the right as you do from the right to left. Even in this situation, things are still going to be moving from left to right and right to left. But now that you have the same number on either side, in any given moment, in any given uh, period of time, you have an equal probability of things moving from the left to the right as you do from the right to the left. So you're getting to kind of this equilibrium situation. Sure, in a given, you know, if you take a certain unit of time, maybe that one moves from the left to the right, that one moves from the left to the right, that one moves from the left to the right. But since you have equal concentrations on both sides, you're just as likely to have the same number move from right to left. And I only did this with 20 I only did this with 20 particles, which is a little bit of an artificially low number. If we're actually talking about concentrations of air molecules, or as we'll see when we think about cellular membranes, if we think about uh, different types of molecules that might be in an aqueous solution, we're talking about way more than 20 molecules. And so you really do think in terms of probabilistic large numbers, well, hey, for the probability of something move from the left to the right is the same as the right to left, and so you're going to have the stability. Right here, there's a much higher probability in any given moment of something moving from left to right than right to left, and that's why you see things moving from high concentration to low concentration. Or another way to think about it, what we just observed here is we saw things diffusing down their, down their concentration gradient. So this process that we just described, this is diffusion. This is diffusion. And as we study different types of systems, we'll see that this is actually very important to biological systems and even chemical systems. Because this doesn't require an an any extra energy to move the molecules from here to there. This is going to happen probabilistically. It's going to happen naturally. And once again, no magic. Just more stuff here, higher chance moving from left to right than moving from right to left. And I, I really want to make that point clear. You can still move from right to left. For example, you might have this character, maybe his Maybe instead of moving in that direction, completely possible, completely possible that he goes from right to left. It's not like everything is moving from left to right, but you have a higher chance you're going to have more things moving from left to right. So that guy could move in that direction because there's just more stuff here, and they're all bouncing around in all in all different in all different random directions. Diffusion is a net passive movement of particles from a region in which they are in high concentration to regions of lower concentration. It continues until the concentration of substances is uniform throughout. Uh, here we see uh, uh, green water particles and uh, red uh, particles of another substance. And uh, this is a, uh, there, there is a uh, lower uh, gradient concentration. Uh, it means that shallow concentration gradient means a slower rate of diffusion. There's um, again um, green color is one part particles and um, red color is another substance.
Steeper concentration gradient means a faster rate over diffusion. High diffusion rate, short distance, large surface area, a big concentration difference, fixed law. High temperatures increase diffusion, large molecules slow diffusion. Fixed law, number of proteins channels will affect rate of diffusion too. Temperature too, uh, more heat means more kinetic energy. Radio diffusion equal to surface area multiplied by concentration of gradient and divided to diffusion distance. Um, some measure examples of diffusion in biology. Gas exchange at the alveoli. Oxygen from air to blood. Carbon dioxide from blood to air. Gas exchange for photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide from air to leaf. Uh, oxygen from leaf to air. Gas exchange for respiration. Oxygen from blood to tissue cells. Carbon dioxide in opposite direction. Transfer of transmitted substances. Acetylcholine from um, presynaptic to postsynaptic membrane at the synapse. A lab for diffusion demonstration. In this demonstration, we will make observation of diffusion of a serum permeable membrane and we will able to compare this observation to the function of the cell membrane. Uh, iodine and starch are used in this lab because iodine is a novel indicator for starch. Iodine will change colors uh, in the presence of starch. Uh, materials needed. Dialysis tube mm, here. Uh, iodine, starch, two large clear beakers, and distilled water. Uh, first of all, we uh, fill a dialysis tube uh, from one spoon of starch and half cup of distilled water. First of all, we should fix the dialysis tube. Uh, we should tie the dialysis tube closed, like here. Uh, we uh, fill a dialysis tube with uh, one spoon of starch and a half cup of distilled water. After, uh, we should place the dialysis tube and fix Like mm, this. And put your DNA solution inside this. Uh, what do you think will happen when we put the baggy in the uh, water mixture? After about 15 minutes, the iodine will have seeped into the dialysis tube, turning the bottom part of the dialysis tube uh, starch, uh, a purplish black color. As a result, the liquid inside the dialysis tube goes blue with the iodine solution. Uh, the blue color is characteristic of the reaction that takes place between starch and iodine and is used as a test for starch. The results show that glucose molecules have passed through the dialysis tube into the water, but the starch molecules haven't moved out of uh, the dialysis tube. This is what we would expect if the dialysis tube was partially permeable on the basis of the, its pore size. Starch molecules are very large, probably can't get through the pores. Osmosis is the movement of water molecules across a semi-permeable membrane from an area of greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration. Here we have red blood cells in solution. The red blood cell has a semi-permeable membrane. Tonicity is the measure of the osmotic pressure of two solutions separated by a semi-permeable membrane. It is commonly used when describing the response of cells immersed in an external solution. Like osmotic pressure, Tonicity is influenced only by solutes, such as sugar, that cannot cross the membrane. There are three classifications of tonicity that one solution can have relative to another. Those three classifications are isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. If a solution is hypotonic, there is a greater concentration of solute within the cell than there is in the surrounding solution. 
As a result, water molecules enter the cell. As the water molecules continue to enter the cell, the cell becomes larger and larger. If water molecules continue to diffuse into the cell, it will cause the cell to swell up to the point that lysis or rupture may occur. In this demonstration, dialysis tubing and a sugar solution are used to demonstrate a hypotonic solution. First, a three centimeter length of dialysis tubing was cut. The tubing was briefly soaked in water, then rubbed between the fingers to open the tubing. One end of the tubing was twisted, doubled back, and secured with an orthodontic rubber band to prevent leaking. The tubing was then filled with a concentrated sugar solution and sugar granules. The second end of the tubing was also twisted, making sure that no air molecules were in the cell. An orthodontic rubber band was used to secure the second end as well. The completed cell was weighed on a digital balance and then was gently placed in a beaker of tap water. After 30 minutes, the cell was removed from the beaker, gently patted dry, and again weighed on the digital balance. As you can see, there was a significant gain in weight from the water molecules entering the cell. If a solution is hypertonic, there is a greater concentration of solute outside the cell than there is inside the cell. As a result, water leaves the cell and the cell shrinks. In this demonstration, a three centimeter length of dialysis tubing and concentrated sugar water again were used. The cell was created as before, except this time tap water was poured into the dialysis tubing cell. After both ends were secure, the cell was weighed on the digital balance. The cell was then placed in a beaker of concentrated sugar solution. After approximately 30 minutes, the cell was removed from the sugar water solution and again weighed on the digital balance. As you can see, the cell lost a significant amount of weight and has become very flaccid or lacking in firmness. When a cell shrinks, it is said to be crenate. If a solution is isotonic, there is an equal concentration of solute both inside and outside of the cell. Although water molecules continuously move into the cell and out of the cell, the concentration on both sides of the semi-permeable membrane remain the same. In this demonstration, a cell was again formed from the dialysis tubing and was filled with tap water. After both ends of the cell were securely fastened, this cell also was weighed on a digital balance. The cell was placed in a beaker of tap water for half an hour. As you can see, the weight of the cell remained constant. Potatoes are from the pure with diluted solution. 
solution doesn't change because uh, the style changes the potato in solution equals the same. And from that we can see that uh, the potato from hypotonic solution had swollen while in the hypot hypotonic had shrunk up. So that completely confirmed our hypothesis and we can see that our experiments were successful. We are going to talk about facilitated diffusion. So first of all, uh, I'm going to say about the definition. So facilitated diffusion, this is a movement of specific molecules down the concentration gradient passing through the membrane with a specific carrier protein. Um. Uh, this special proteins, carrier proteins. Uh, so let's talk about the main characteristics of facilitated diffusion. First one is selected by um, shape, charge and size. And second one is um, that it is passive and requires no energy from the cell. Um, so what kind of substances um, pass across the cell membrane um, by facilitated diffusion? Only small nonpolar molecules, uh, such as oxygen, can diffuse easily across the cell. Uh, but pore molecules in charged ions cannot diffuse freely across the plasma membrane due to the hydrophobic nature of the fatty, fatty acid tails of phospholipids that make up the liquid bilayers. Uh, so, let's talk about how does facilitated diffusion differ from simple diffusion. In facilitated diffusion, molecules only move with the aid of protein in the membrane. Uh, simple diffusion requires molecules to move through special doorways in the cell membranes. And uh, what is the similarity between simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion? Simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion uh, both allow molecules uh, molecules across the cell membrane without any expenditure of energy by the cell. So, simple diffusion uh, is the movement of molecules um, from across the cell membrane uh, from the area of uh, high concentration to an area of low concentration. Um, so, let's talk um, about the mechanism of um, facilitated diffusion. Here you can see um, uh, the outside of cell and inside of cell. There are three uh, glucose carrier proteins. Uh, the first one is uh, with open door. Here, uh, glucose should um, enter, and then uh, this protein um, will be inside of this glucose carrier protein. And in the, uh, the last step, uh, this uh, glucose will like leave this glucose carrier protein uh, inside of the cell. So, as we can see, glucose is moving from out of the cell to the inside of the cell uh, with help of glucose carrier proteins. In the first video on passive transport, we talked about the most passive of passive transports, and that is simple diffusion. And we talked about how small, non-charged, non-polar molecules would actually have the easiest time, things like carbon dioxide or molecular oxygen, would have the easiest time diffusing through the cellular membrane. They are small enough to kind of get through the little gaps here, and then since they have no charge or polarity, they're, gonna, they're going to be fairly indifferent as they pass through. And then we talked about in between you have things like water molecules, which are small enough to pass through the gaps, but they have some polarity, so they're not going to be able to get through super easily, but they will be able to seep through. And then we talked about things that would have a, a tough time, and that's charged particles. Because charged particles, and we have some ions right over here, sodium ion, a potassium ion, even though these are fairly small, they're going to interact a lot with the phosphate with the phosphate heads right over here with this charge, which is going to keep, which is going to make it hard for them to actually penetrate through the the membrane. What I want to talk about in this video is still passive transport. Remember, passive transport is about not using energy. It's about moving down the concentration gradient. But we're going to talk about ways that passive transport can happen a little bit easier for some of these molecules over here. And that's because their transport, their passive transport, is going to be facilitated. So what we're going to talk about in this video, let me figure out a place where I could write it, is facilitated, facilitated diffusion. Let me write that down. Facilitated, facilitated diffusion. 
So the last video was just a straight up diffusion. Now we're going to talk about facilitating it. So what do you think if you were trying to engineer something that would make it easy for these thi these these types of molecules either a water molecule or an ion to move down its concentration gradient what would you do Well the you might say well if I did if it didn't have to mess with all of this you know all the 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 hydrophilic heads and then the hydrophobic tails and then the hydrophilic heads here well that would make it pretty easy to move down your diffusion gradient and that's exactly what has emerged in nature essentially just tunnels through tunnels through the membrane and so one form of facilitated diffusion can happen through what we call channel proteins and let me write this in orange for no good reason channel 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 proteins channel proteins and an example of a channel protein might be this one right over here and maybe this one is specialized for being a channel for water for and so we would call this this particular one we could call an aquaporin aqua aquaporin which is just a channel protein for water and so you see it has this hole on top and let's say you had more water molecules outside the cell then you have inside the cell and you wanted to move down its concentration gradient or maybe it just what you have a higher concentration of solute here and so we're going to have osmosis occurring so the water molecules are going to they're more likely to come they're more likely to come from the outside to the inside than from the inside to the outside and so you could have water molecules going there and they don't even have to really mess with the membrane they're just going to go through this aquaport pro this aquaporin and then come out come out on the inside of the cell And you have similar channel proteins for ions. So this might be one for ions. And so let's say that this is a sodium these are sodium ions right over here. They're charged. They would have trouble getting through, but this channel protein might be might be specific to them and allows them it allows them to go through. And as we'll see when you study things like neurons, we'll see that these channel proteins especially for ions are incredibly important for amplifying an electrical signal down or a, a chemoelectrical signal, I guess I could say. And they can also be gated. They can also open and close depending on different conditions that are in different parts of the cell. So these channel proteins, they could just be open or they could be open and closed gated uh, based on different conditions, which you can see that's actually key to what happens in nerve cells that we'll see in future videos. Now another type of facilitated diffusion can occur through what we call carrier proteins. Carrier proteins. And I want to be clear, well, I'm going to talk about carrier proteins, but people are still studying exactly how they work. But the view is, okay, let me just draw the membrane here. Let me draw let me draw a membrane. I'm going to do a carrier protein. I'm going to draw a carrier protein in the membrane. So this is a this is a cross section of this is of my membrane my phospholipid bilayer here almost done and then a carrier protein and the way i'm going to draw it isn't exactly how a carrier protein would actually look but it would hopefully give you the right idea so maybe it's like this maybe it's like this Yeah, and things if things want to move down their concentration gradient let's say you have a higher concentration above And I'm just going to say some arbitrary some arbitrary particle has a higher concentration above than it does below. They can actually attach potentially or be or kind of get into a compartment over here and then that would trigger the carrier protein to change its shape so that and let me see if I can draw its changed shape well. So it could change its shape. So this is when it's taking stuff from above and then and then when it sees that hey, I've got stuff here it can let me it can change its shape to look something like this so it could kind of flip around let me get the other tool it could whoops I'm really having trouble with my tools today all right all right it could flip around like this so before it was open to the top but now it could flip around and the stuff that it just collected from the top could be dumped inside inside the cell And once again, this is passive transport because it's all about things moving down their concentration gradient. If there was no cellular membrane here, these things would have moved in this direction. You would have had more things moving in this direction in a given amount of time than you would have had things going in the opposite direction. But the cellular membrane was getting in the way, but then this carrier membrane can facilitate that passive transport. It can facilitate the actual diffusion. And now 
let's check our uh, mood uh, and you can go and take your questions. Please go. <coughs> let's work in groups. You can discuss your questions. Uh, diffusing. 
And also it uses protein channels in the membrane and the maximum rate of diffusion depends on the number of these channels. Okay. And uh, explain the difference between the curves for a simple and facilitated diffusion. A uh, simple diffusion is a type of a passive transport where uh, no energy is required for molecules to move out or into the cells across the lipid uh, layers anywhere in the cell membrane. So the speed of uh, transport is increasing almost uh, uh, logarithmically. And in a facilitated diffusion, um, there are special carrier proteins uh, having a central channel that uh, provide a corridor which is selective in nature and allows some molecules to pass through the membrane. Uh, this carrier proteins allow only some molecules to build uh, with the such as some of amino acids or some sugar molecules. Okay, and our last question is about completing the table and uh, the name of the process simple diffusion, energy source, kinetic energy and example movement of O2 through uh, membrane. And uh, second process, facilitated diffusion, energy of source, kinetic energy, example movement of uh, glucose into cells. Uh, auspices, uh, energy source, kinetic energy and example movement of, two, uh, of H2O in and out of cells. And uh, last uh, process, filtration, uh, energy source, hydrostatic pressure, and example, formation of uh, kidney filtrate. Okay, all your answers was absolutely correct. Uh, so, our lesson is finished, your home tasks in your copybooks, and goodbye.